All right, good morning, everybody. I'm super excited that you're here. Hey, last week we celebrated 19 baptisms, and that is really awesome. So 19 people said, listen, I have new life in Christ, and I want to tell the world about it, and that's really amazing. And so thank you for coming back again this week, if you were here last week, or for being here today, whatever it might be. We are continuing and actually ending our series that has been titled Permission to Doubt. Our hope is that as we've worked through this series, you have felt that you have the freedom to kind of doubt some of the things that we read in Scripture or God. However, God says that's okay because I'll always meet you in your doubt and I'll answer those questions. And so today we are finishing that out, and I'm very excited to have the privilege to bring this to you. Uh, and before we kind of move forward, I want to show you some extremely embarrassing photos of myself in much younger years. So this is my wife and I, Carrie, when we were pre-family. And as some of you may think, what were those days like? I don't even remember them. Uh, this was early on in our marriage. And if you have been married and had a good um, initial period of your marriage, you'll know that there's all sorts of fun things that you get to do when you don't have to worry about kids being at the grandparents or with the babysitters and you're not you're looking at your watch and it's 11 o'clock and you don't have you're not filled with dread at the hour because the morning comes so quickly and so we did all sorts of fun things we went on a family cruise we used to go hiking all this fun stuff and we ended up at a point as many do where we go is this the right time to start a family or not now, some of you, when you hear that, you think, you know, I don't even remember those days, and others, maybe you might struggle a bit because you're going through some difficulties in that arena. Uh, but my wife and I, we were there. We were talking about, is this the time to start a family or not? And we, we just didn't know. We had read the Bible. We prayed about it. We talked with people that were godly, and it didn't really seem like we were getting an answer. And so um, in an unrelated note, um, I was working as an intern at a church at the time, and we decided to visit a church that was in Dixon City, Pennsylvania, which it butts right up against Scranton, Pennsylvania, and they had an evening service. And so we said, why don't we just go check out another church to see how they do things and to experience it without any responsibilities whatsoever. We'll just stroll in. They'll add us to the attendance numbers, and it's good for them. It's good for us. And so we went, and the pastor that was speaking, his name was Dan, and in what maybe was a coincidence, he, he was answering this question, how do you make a godly decision? And I looked at my wife, I'm like, huh, that's kind of interesting that this is what we're talking about this week. And so he went through, you know, his whole thing. He, he you know, discussed how you got to make sure that nothing that you want to do is in violation of the word of God. So you have to seek out the scriptures first and you have to pray and you have to ask the Lord and look to hear from him. And then you need to go to godly people and get godly counsel and insight. And he had this whole series of things. And then at the end, he said this, and this is what some of you spouses need to hear that your wife has said a hundred times because they just don't care. He said, sometimes God says, just make whatever decision you want and be done with it. And then he said, if it would really be helpful to you, maybe you can consider to just flip a coin on it. So we went back to the place that we were staying that night. We were house sitting for a couple and we went into the living room and I was like, want to flip a coin on having a kid or not? <laughs> and Carrie goes, might as well. What can it really hurt? And so for the sake of argument, we're going to say you flip the coin and if the coin is heads, you uh, have a baby and if it's tails, you don't. And so, you know, I grab this coin and I flip it in the air and it all happens in slow motion as the coin is flipping and we see it as it's dropping. We look at each other and say, do you really want to do this? And we come back and I catch it in my hand. I turn it over and I look and it's heads. We're having a baby. How exciting that was. But we weren't that convinced. So we said, let's do it again. So we flipped it again, and it was heads. And we flipped it again, and it was heads. Then it was heads. Then it was heads. Then it was heads. And the likelihood of that happening is about 0.781%. It halves each time. And I say, Carrie, I don't know. So I flip the coin again. The eighth time, it's heads. And I'm like, okay, well, that's like, you know, almost four out of a thousand times we do this experiment, do we end up with that? And so we said, you know what? It just seems like God is saying, go ahead and have a baby. Now, 
To me, I remember doing it nine times. My wife remembers doing it 12 times. It was head every time, every time. But I wanted to be honest with you and not exaggerate. So this is the number we come up with. But it lives in like legend for us as we talk about that time. But we did end up starting a family after that. And so we got pregnant and then Catherine was born the next year who got baptized last week, which was just an incredible opportunity to baptize her as she asked Jesus. She said, I want to know you, Lord. I want you to be my savior. Now, that story is kind of silly as far as us not feeling like we could understand exactly what God was saying to us about that situation. So today, I want to give you permission to doubt when God seems silent. Because sometimes, God does seem like he's just not telling us anything. And we don't hear him when we pray. Seems like we don't hear him when we ask others for help. Feels like we don't hear him at church. We don't hear him in worship. We're just struggling because it seems like God is silent. I want to ask you the question, how do we handle when God feels like he's MIA? He's just, it just doesn't seem like he's there. And so to do that, I want to tell you a story that comes from the scriptures that is, quite frankly, confusing. It's confusing because throughout the entire book that has been accepted for thousands of years as the word of God, the Hebrew people considered it scripture, the church has verified that it's scripture throughout all this time, this book of the Bible does not mention God directly. God is not even referenced in it. There's nobody that's a Jew practicing good Judaism at all. And there's not even a single person that prays in the entire book, in the entire story. Essentially, God feels MIA in this story. And yet this is in the Bible. And that is the story of Esther. I'll give you a little bit of history for those of you that may not know this story and where it comes from. So the books of the scripture, or at least they go like this, they go Daniel, the events of Daniel, then Esther, and then Nehemiah. As the Hebrew people were in slavery in Egypt, God brought them out of slavery. He eventually brought them into the promised land, which is now what we know as Israel. And he told them, listen, when you're in this land, please obey me. If you don't obey me, bad things are going to happen to you. And Israel didn't obey God. And so he called King Nebuchadnezzar all the way from Babylon, which is the Iraq area now, called him all the way from Babylon to come in and to take over all of Israel. The kingdom had already split into two. There was the northern tribe and there was the southern tribe. And they came in and they took everybody out of there. And Daniel was one of the young men who was taken away to Babylon. And if you've ever heard of Daniel in the lion's den or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, that's where all of the events unfolded. And so Daniel wrote down his story and his prophecies, and about 125 years later, we find ourselves at the story of Esther. As Persia had taken over the Babylonians, now we're into the Persian Empire, and about 25 years later, the events of the book of Nehemiah unfold, where some of the Hebrew people went back and they rebuilt the walls of uh, Jerusalem. And so I want to give you some insight, because this is a big story that we're going to cover, on who the main characters of the book of Esther are. So we have Mordecai, who is a wise and faithful man. We have Esther, the heroine of the story, who's humble and beautiful. We have Haman, who's selfish and evil. And then we have Xerxes, who's drunk and powerful. Some of, your, some of your translations may say Ahasuerus, but that is Xerxes, King Xerxes, who's drunk and powerful. And so all of this takes place as Xerxes was reigning over Persia, 
Around 480 BC is where the book picks up, and Esther comes onto the scene a few years later. If you look at this map of the empire of Persia, you see all the way over here is where Israel is. They were taken into captivity in Babylon, and then the events of Esther unfold all the way over here in Persepolis, which was the capital in the, the area of Susa, which is over here, and that's where the events take place. And if you look at this temple, or this palace, rather, this is the palace of King Xerxes. A lot of the events that we're talking about actually happened right here, which is really cool to remember as we go through this. Well, Xerxes was drunk, as is the case in many parts of this story, and he was hosting a party with all of his nobles, and this party went on for many, many, many days. And he was married to a woman named Vashti at the time, and she was beautiful. And so he said to all of his people, I'm going to get Queen Vashti, and she's going to come over here so that all of you can see how beautiful she is. She's going to exploit herself so you can all lust after her, and you can see how great of a man I am because of how beautiful she is. And Vashti gets this message and says, no way am I going over there to let all those men do that to me. Not a chance. And so the king, you know, Xerxes is upset and he's drunk and he looks at his advisor, what do we do? And they tell him what all male advisors would do. They say, Xerxes, you have to do something or else all of the women in all of Persia will rebel against their husbands because your wife did this to you. And so he has her sent away and essentially dethrones her as queen, wants nothing more to do with her, leaving himself with no queen. And that's where the story of Esther picks up. Xerxes sends out a decree, again at the advice of um, some of his counselors, to host a beauty pageant of sorts. He says, I want you to go out and find the most beautiful virgins in all of, in all of Persia, and I want you to bring them all to me. And then something's going to happen, and he's going to pick out a queen. Now, for those of you that maybe grew up around church, or maybe you're on Pure Flicks right now and you can see Veggie Tales, if you know what Veggie Tales is, in Veggie Tales, <laughs> Queen Esther has always oh, such a beautiful voice. And she sings about God's faithfulness, and uh, Xerxes and Haman, they hold their thumbs up and say, that's the one, I pick her. All right, here's what actually happened in the real story of Esther. This one's tricky. Really, what happened is that all of those beautiful young virgins were brought in to Xerxes' harem for about a year or more. Esther was about 10 months, but generally for a year or more, they were given beauty treatments. They were made as beautiful as possible. They were trained in all sorts of different things. And then Xerxes decided which one of them had the best sex with him, and he picked that person and made them his queen. And so Xerxes fell deeply in love with Esther. And we look at this, at least I look at this, and I think to myself, this young Jewish girl does whatever she does with this pagan king, and he picks her to be the queen. It's an interesting way for the heroine of this story and ultimately of the Jewish people to come onto the scene. Now, when she was made queen, Mordecai, who was actually Esther's adoptive father but was really her cousin, um, they, had, they were family, and he told Esther, Esther, don't tell anybody that we're related, for one. I don't want anyone to know. And also, don't tell anybody that you're Jewish. We don't know why exactly he said that. Maybe he had some sort of an inclination, but he said, don't tell anybody that you're Jewish. And while that was happening, while that transaction was taking place, a man named Haman was rising up into power under the authority of Xerxes. And he became essentially the right-hand man of Xerxes. He not only had his ear, but he had his hand of power. And everybody was supposed to bow down and show reverence and respect to Haman as he walked by. That was the decree of Xerxes. Well, the cousin of Esther, Mordecai, who is the wise and faithful individual, he worked at the gate of the palace. And any time that Haman would walk by, people would bow down before Haman, but Mordecai refused to bow down before Haman. Why he refused? 
I don't totally know. Maybe there could be a variety of reasons. But this filled Haman with rage whenever this happened. It doesn't matter the hundreds or thousands of people that fell down to show reverence to Haman otherwise. This one individual, Mordecai, he learned to hate. And he especially hated him because he was a Jew. Now, while that's taking place, Mordecai, who's faithfully working in the palace at that time, he happens to overhear a conversation between two individuals that are also serving in Xerxes' court. And he overhears an assassination attempt that they're going to kill the king. So Mordecai, wanting to be faithful, he goes to Esther. Again, remember, nobody knew they were related. He goes to Esther and says, Esther, the king is in serious danger. And so Esther goes to Xerxes, and they foil the plan. The king lives, and Esther tells um, the people that write the records of everything, please know that it was Mordecai who overheard this plan and foiled it. He, she wanted to make sure that he got record for that. Well, Haman is still, even through all this, is still filled with hatred towards Mordecai. So he comes up with a plan. Then Haman approached uh, King Xerxes and said, there's a certain race of people scattered through all the provinces of your empire who keep themselves separate from everyone else. Their laws are different from those of any other people, and they refuse to obey the laws of the king. So it's not in the king's interest to let them live. Haman hated Mordecai so much he was seeking the genocide of every single Jew in all of Persia. And Xerxes being such, it really seems like such a drunken fool, he says, go for it, whatever you want. And he takes his signet ring and he signs a decree that says, um, a day off in the future, which um, Haman actually rolled dice called the Purim, and he rolled the dice and it said like the following March, Every single Jew was to be executed everywhere throughout Persia. Mordecai, or sorry, Haman was a hateful, anti-Semitic evil, and as God called him, an enemy of the Jews. In short, Haman is death and despair. And so I ask you this morning, who or what is your Haman. What in your life is that thing or that person that just brings all of the negativity and maybe even some of the evil and the despair and, the, and death to you? There's lots of things it could be. Conflict in your marriage, that's unbelievably hard. Children that are hard to rein in on. Financial struggle can feel like it just takes the dignity out of your life. Fear over health, your job, a boss that's, man, it's like nobody really understands how bad this is. What is your Haman? And then, does God care enough to destroy your Haman? Maybe not literally destroy a person or whatever, but destroy that control and that death and despair that has a grip on you. Does God even care enough? Well, this decree of Haman went out all over Persia, and the Jewish people were terrified. I mean, they were about to be eradicated, interestingly enough, for not just the first time in history and wouldn't be the last time either, but they were terrified. And so Mordecai sends word to Esther. He says, Esther, you have to do something. She says, Mordecai, I don't think you understand. If I go into the king unannounced and ask a question, he'll kill me. And the off chance is that maybe he'll let me talk to him. And so this is how the rest of that conversation unfolds. Mordecai sent this reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all the other Jews are killed. Remember, no one knew that Esther was a Jew, which kind of makes this story layered in more complexity. 
He says, if you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. Then Mordecai says one of the most popular verses for sure in the book of Esther, but maybe also in all of the early scriptures that we have. He says, who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. And so Mordecai glimpsed the plan that was unfolding. He was smart. He was wise. Maybe he was faithful as a Jew, even though he was living there in Persia. And Esther submitted to what he said. And she asked all of the Jews to fast. She said, for three days, I want every Jewish person to fast. And then I will walk in to the presence of Xerxes, even though I haven't been there for an entire month. I'll walk into his presence. I'll throw my life up in the air and just trust that whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And whether I live or whether I die, it's what I'm going to do. She took the advice of Mordecai. And so on the third day of fasting, she walks in, and this is what she's hoping for. She's hoping that as she walks in, Xerxes holds out his gold scepter, and she can touch the end of it, which meant he was telling her, you're not going to die. You're going to be safe. And for her, it really probably felt like a coin toss or the roll of a die, just like Haman had rolled to determine when the Jews would be killed. But she said, you know what? I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to hope for a certain outcome, but I'm just going to do it to try to save my people. That's a lot of courage to be willing to walk into that, to face Haman ultimately. On the third day of the fast, Esther put on her royal robe and entered the inner court of the palace just across from the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne facing the entrance. And when he saw Queen Esther standing there in the inner court, he welcomed her and held out the gold scepter to her. So Esther approached and touched the end of the scepter. Then the king asked her, what do you want, Queen Esther? What is your request? I will give it to you, even if it's half of the entire kingdom. And you got to believe that Esther was thinking to herself, were you made queen for just such a time as this. And so she requests that Xerxes and Haman, just the two of them, would come to a banquet that she had prepared. She doesn't go directly to him with the request to save her people. She kind of looks to butter Xerxes up just a little bit before making that tough ask. And this is what I want to tell you. You don't know what God's response to you may be. In your situation, with your Haman, whatever that thing is that has come into your mind, you don't know what God's response will be if you choose to truly walk into the presence of Xerxes and just present it there. But I will say this. You do have God's promises if you remember what Mordecai said, he's like, salvation for the Jews will come from somewhere. You have God's promises. I'll just tell you this story. Early on in marriage, um, finances were not like plentiful, right? And we've always had to be wise with money, but especially very early on. Um, my wife and I, it was tough. And we were really faithful to God as best as we knew how to be. We believe that God gave us 100% of our money, and so we gave him back 10% as a tithe to our church. I was working in uh, as an intern making very, very, very little money. My wife was working, and we had a wonderful budget that we worked through, and we were right on that line of, um, you know, making it or not making it from month to month. But I'll tell you this, sometimes we were different places, and people would literally, like, slip money into our pocket, like in an unbelievable way that put gas in the car to make an hour or two-hour trip or to get the groceries that we needed for that week. 
And I can remember the faces of the people that looked at us and said, I just feel like God wanted us to give this to you. We have the promises of God that our faithfulness to him will always be returned with his faithfulness to us. And that's such a beautiful and wonderful thing. But are we willing to walk into the, um, into the throne room of Xerxes to face that? Well, the king and Haman came into the banquet that Esther was having. And Xerxes was high on himself. He just loved being with his beautiful bride. And Haman, pompous and arrogant as he was, he felt like he's like, I'm so powerful here. He felt so puffed up and so big and so royal that it's just me and the king in the presence of this beautiful queen. And they both left fat and happy and probably a bit drunk, and they left, and well, there goes Haman past Mordecai, who once again did not bow down to show him reverence and respect. And Haman's joy was turned to malice towards Mordecai. And so he goes home and he tells his wife, whether I'm with the king and queen or wherever I am, none of it matters at all as long as that Jew Mordecai lives. And so his wife says, well, why don't you just build a gallows and be done with it and execute him? And so he thinks that that's a good idea. So he, on his own property, builds an execution platform to kill Mordecai on the next day. Well, while that story is unfolding, King Xerxes can't get to sleep. He's struggling with insomnia. He's laying there awake. And so he says to some of his advisors, he's like, would you bring me the history books, the scrolls, and just start reading me the various accounts of the kingdom? And to that I would say, history books have been putting people to sleep for like thousands of years. And so if you're a history buff, You're the exception, I promise you. Uh, And so he takes and and the books are being read to him. And all of a sudden, the story of Mordecai saving his life is read to him. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Did we do anything to honor Mordecai for this? And they say, no, we didn't do anything. Him being allowed to be alive is the honor that we give just about anybody, let alone doing something more. And so the king says, I got to do something about this. So he calls for Haman, who happened to be in the area, um, having come from demanding that this execution platform was built, this gallows was built. And so Haman comes into the king, and Xerxes says, Haman, I need your help. There's somebody that I want to show honor to. What should I do? And Haman is so conceited and selfish, he, he actually says to himself, Who could the king possibly want to honor more than me? And so, appearing to be humble, he says, Oh, king, if you want to honor somebody, you should take your royal clothing and put it on them. And take a horse that you have ridden and put him on that. Have somebody march him all through the streets and say, This is what the king does for somebody who he wishes to honor. And Xerxes looks at Haman and says, I love it. And Haman's like, here we go. And Xerxes looks at him and says, I want you to do that for Mordecai. And the malice within Haman just seethes up. But he's got to listen. That's the king. So he puts Mordecai in royal robes on a royal horse and marches him through the, through the city saying, this is what is done for somebody that the king wants to honor. And all of this is just building hatred even more and more towards the Jewish people and towards Mordecai. Well, Haman and the king end up at Esther's place again. So Esther, at the banquet the night before, says, would you come back to another banquet tomorrow? And Xerxes is probably thinking to himself, she wants something pretty big if she's inviting me to dinner two times in a row. And they end up at Esther's banquet again. It's just just Esther and Haman and Xerxes. And they eat this amazing meal. And Xerxes looks at Esther and says, Esther, what is it that you really want? Would you tell me? And she looks at him and says this. Queen Esther replied, 
If I have found favor with the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my request, I ask that my life and the lives of my people will be spared. She says, king, save me. And he says to her, who would do such a thing? Xerxes demanded. Who would be so presumptuous as to even touch you? And Esther, Esther replied, this wicked Haman is our adversary and our enemy. And at that, Haman grew pale with fright before the king and queen. He knows he's in trouble now. And Xerxes, in his anger and in his stupor, charges out of the room to go outside and to get some fresh air. And when he does that, Haman comes over to Esther and falls down and grabs a hold of her robes, grabs a hold of her, and says, Esther, please show me mercy. Please save me from this. And then Xerxes walks back in the room and says to him, even while I'm here, you would assault my wife? And they put a bag over his head and lead him away. And Xerxes has him executed on the same gallows that he had built up to have Mordecai executed. Well, the problem is that this didn't actually solve the issue of all the Jews being killed. And so Esther and Mordecai come before the king and say, is there something that can happen? And Xerxes says, well, not really, because I signed the law that you would die. And they say, well, could you do this? Could you sign a law that says we could defend ourselves? And so that's what he does. And they send it all throughout Persia that the Jewish people would be able to defend themselves. And the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, but quite the opposite happened. It was the Jews who overpowered their enemies. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the king's provinces to attack anyone who tried to harm them. The Jewish people are saved. Haman's entire family is defeated and killed. And the Jewish people now celebrate, celebrate the festival of Purim each year, stealing the name of the dice that Haman rolled to determine their execution date. And they still celebrate that to this day. Now, you'll notice we didn't mention God at all in this story. Because through the entire book of Esther, there ain't nothing there. So in a book without God, was he really... MIA. Here's what I would submit to you. The book of Esther and the story of Esther is God's fingerprint on ordinary life. Tim Mackey with the Bible Project says this, God can and does work in the real mess and moral ambiguity of human history. He uses the faithfulness of even morally compromised people to accomplish his purpose. I would say this, that God is big enough to defeat Haman. God was working all through the book of Esther so that we could see what he was doing. Vashti refusing to go into the king, Esther being beautiful and young and chosen, Mordecai happening to work at the palace, happening to overhear the assassination attempt. It was written down in the book of the law. The king happened to grant Esther um, the ability to be with him by holding out the scepter. He came to dinner. The book when the king had insomnia happened to be open up to what Mordecai did. All of these different things were supernaturally designed by God to bring about salvation for the Jewish people. And Esther stands as one of the greatest heroines of, of the Jews that has ever lived and probably will ever live. And this is what it looks like when God is, in a sense, behind the scenes. And I would say to you that God's fingerprint is on our ordinary lives too. God may appear silent but is actually always working. There's things that God is doing, even when you think, why is God so silent right now? Why do I seem to not be able to see him right now? I promise you, he's working in the background. 
we desire the supernatural. That's the type of way we like to see God work, is in extraordinary, big, grandiose, supernatural sorts of ways. But God often works in the ordinary, where sometimes we don't see exactly what he has done and what he will do. But I'll also tell you this, I believe we've been given 95 or more percent of God's will for our life already. And he's done that because he's given us the word of God. By having the completed scriptures with us, which were inspired by God, by having those, we have more of God's exact words and revelation than anybody has ever had at least for the past 2,000 years ago, we've had his word ever since the book of Revelation was finished. We have more than Adam and Eve had. We have more than Abraham had and Moses and David and all of the prophets. We have more than the apostles. We have more of God's word than has ever been had before. And I would even tell you this. God has spoken to you this morning. You've heard the word of God already. Because we've opened up his scripture and we've read it. 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17 says this, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong with our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So I'll say this. I know that it might feel like God is silent, but God directly speaks to your marriages, your children, and time, and money, and jobs, and temperament, and entertainment, sexuality, and humor, and passion, and purpose, and identity, and worth, and church, and dedications, and priorities. God has already said a massive amount about every single one of these. And sometimes... What we actually need is the courage to listen and to obey what God has already said. If you get in a quiet room, and you close your eyes, and you talk to the Lord, likely there will be things in the area that you are wondering about that God has already instructed you what to do. Things like patience, and love, and gentleness, and transparency, and honorability, truthfulness. Ways that we can handle ourselves in every single one of these areas. I'm not discounting the uniqueness of our situation. It's still important. We all have the tiny little details of every scenario that God has spoken to that are still different enough that we get tripped up over them. So I'm not discounting that at all. I know that that's the case. I know that when it seems like God is silent, and if we're really not ignoring what we know he says to do, because that's the place that you start, but when God feels silent and there's those small things that kind of trip us up, I would say, I would actually say this, we need to trust that he's working. Because God is working. He's continually putting his fingerprint on your life. Romans 8, 28 says this, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. When it seems like God is silent, we need to choose trust while looking for the evidence of what he's been doing in our life already. I'm going to have the worship team come up because we're going to sing a song about this where I would encourage you to sit and to process what's going on in your life. Process what feels like the silence of God and go back if you have to and look at your life, look at your childhood, look at your, um, in your teenage years right now, look at your schooling, look at your parents, look at your family, look at your job, look at your ability to work, look at all of the different things and think to yourself, God, where have I seen you here? As I was sitting earlier, I was just thinking to myself, 
all of the different places I can see the fingerprint of God in my own life. And we're going to sing this song together that's all about the evidence of God in our heart. And when we sit and we go, God, you've been there. I can see the evidence of you in my life. What it gives us the opportunity to do is to actively put our trust in God. It's a choice. It's not an emotion to say, God, I will walk into the presence of Xerxes, whether I live or whether I die. I'll do what you ask me to do. I'll look for the evidence of what you've done because when you're silent, I know that you're working. I'm going to trust that you're working. So let's stand and sing together this song about the evidence of God in our life.